Affirming arguments and the biblical response. This is the second part of the series that we've done. Uh, it'll end today. And I think that these are important things for us to talk about because society is talking about them. And if the church remains silent, then all we hear is from the world on this very important topic that isn't going anywhere. And so last week, we established a couple of things that we have to address before we can get into affirming arguments. And you have to be able to say yes to these two things. One, do you believe that the Bible is inerrant or infallible, which means without error? It has to be a yes. And number two, do you believe it is God-breathed or Holy Spirit-inspired Genesis to Revelation? That has to be a yes. If you can't say yes to those two things, then this isn't the biblical response. It's affirming arguments in your and I's opinion. And otherwise, you can't move forward. And then what we did as well last week is we set a few other base, basics for theology. We talked about this as a theological issue, not a political issue. It has crept into politics, but it's a theological issue. And then we answered a few questions. I also, by the way, gave you opportunity to turn in some questions of your own. And some did, and we're going to address some of those. And y'all didn't take it easy on me. I'll just say that. So thanks a lot. Uh, there were two different books that I referenced last week. We'll reference both of these again this week. I have no idea if we have any more in the merch. I'd be shocked if we did. We sold out after first service, I think, last, last week. But here's the first book um, that we will be addressing today. I've read this book from cover to cover twice. Um, it is Jackie Hill Perry's autobiography of her journey in a same-sex relationship and what God did in her life. It also, by the way, gives some very, very strong direction of areas that the church has gone wrong in this subject and what we can do better. Um, I will tell you that this book is not for all ages. It is heartbreaking. As a father of daughters, there were things in there that were very difficult to read, but we live in a broken, evil world. And so this is one book that we'll be referencing. Here's the other one. Um, I've read this cover to cover as well. It's a little more liturgical, a little more of a reference, a study guide, if you will, um, by Dr. Preston Sprinkle called Does the Bible Support Same-Sex Marriage? And he addresses some of the topics that we have and will be addressing as well as more, and he goes into a lot more depth. So I encourage you to read both of those books. And again, I don't know if they're in the merch area. I'd be shocked if they are, but I assume you know how to buy books by now. You guys are pretty smart. And so we're going to be going through a couple of the affirming arguments and pick up where we left last week. We're going to go through the biblical response, and then we're going to pivot and spend the second half of our time today about what do we do with this knowledge now? How can churches do better at reaching a group of people that we have done a terrible job of reaching and loving and valuing? So how can we do that without applauding and affirming things that are against the Bible, but also without rejecting and and condemning people. Where's the middle ground? So we're gonna, I'm going to start off right, right away with the number one argument that I hear from people. And it was the number one thing turned in last week or some variation of it. And so it's an umbrella. And here's the statement. I was born gay, so it can't be wrong. I hear this all the time, and this is incredibly difficult of a conversation. It starts with what we talked about last week, that you have to first establish that your sexuality is not your identity. It's not who you are. You are not your sexuality. You're so much more valuable, and there's so much more to you than just your sexual preference. However, this is something that comes up all the time, and it's a great question. If I was born this way, how can God be against it? And, and so the very first thing I want to do is let's take a look at it from a scientific standpoint. So I spent the last two weeks reading a bunch of articles on a lot of different types of things that they have, studies that have been shown and done on this topic. Uh, some of them were about as interesting as watching paint dry. And some of them I was like, man, this is, this is fairly interesting. I want to start off with the big one. It was in 2008 by the American Psychological Association, known as the APA. Not a very conservative publication whatsoever, but they did the most extensive study on this topic that has been done. And here is their, what they have officially released as their conclusion. I'll have it up on the screen. They said, no findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude the sexual orientation is determined by any particular factor or factors. Many think that nature and nurture both play roles. What they're saying is, is there's no scientific evidence that your sexuality is linked to anything biologically, but it has everything to do with nature versus nurture. Those of you that took Psychology 101 in, in a class, Intro to Psych, uh, there's the nature versus nurture, the idea of it has a lot more to play with what has happened to you 
and the environment in which you grew up in has were way more determining factors of your sexual preference than anything biological. And I read a bunch of other studies. I read ones about um, that, that um, third children uh, have a highest, higher propensity than the oldest and the middle child towards homosexual attraction, um, which was inconclusive, obviously. And uh, there was ones about different antib antibodies and proteins, and all of them come to the same conclusion of there's nothing conclusive that shows that this is true. And so I want to let you know this, and I have it on the screen. I believe the attempt to tie behavior to biology is an effort to normalize sin. It's an effort to say, I was born this way, therefore it can't be wrong. Listen to what is written in Psalms 51.5. It says, um, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And all of those that serve at center point in the toddler room say amen. Amen. You ever been around a toddler before? I'm like, oh my gosh, you're the most selfish parasite I have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is this, I want you to listen. We are all born with some level of sexual dysfunction. We are. Men, let me just speak to you for a moment because I is one. None of us are born with the propensity towards purity of our eyes and our thoughts. None of us. It is something that you constantly manage and that you choose we're born with sexual dysfunction. I, 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 I want to speak to the, to the wives in the room, those of you who are married, for just a moment. The moment that you and your husband got married, every other woman in the world didn't become ugly. Now, they became not as pretty as you, of course, but they didn't become ugly. And so what we have to say is, is that just because I am born with an attraction doesn't justify it or make it theologically permissible. It's a flawed argument, to be honest, because if you take that argument and extrapolate it over other sexual desires, it doesn't hold water. Here's what I mean. I studied a lot of cases two weeks ago about things, about interviews with convicted pedophiles, and almost every one of them said, I was born with a desire for children. I was born with an attraction for younger people. And so the same argument then would justify that and make it permissible. In the first century Rome, there were people who were born, believe it or not, with an attraction to animals. It's why Paul had to address bestiality in Scripture. The attraction doesn't make it permissible. The attraction doesn't justify changing the Word of God. And so because I'm attracted to multiple women, therefore it must be okay then that I can marry all of them. Or that we can all marry each other. And four, five, six, seven, eight of us can get married. Here is the flaw of this argument, church, is what is the line then that becomes permissible and who establishes that line? It has to be the Word of God. If you eliminate the authority of the Word of God, then who is it that sets it? Society? Culture? Speaking of that, Point number two, that's an elite level segue right there. Some of you missed that. Fully affirming LGBTQ people is on the right side of history. That culture is trending in this way. That if you affirm same-sex unions, you'll be on the right side of history. If you don't, history is going to look back at you as a bigot, as an uncaring, unloving person. This is another affirming argument. And what this will do is it will link society and problems that the United States of America have dealt with, and it links this with it. So it talks, we talked about last week, in 2015, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution there was added that legalized same-sex marriages. And what this argument does is it attempts to link that with, in 1870, the 15th Amendment of the Constitution allowed African Americans to vote. Here's a picture of what happened after the 15th Amendment. The right decision to make, not uh, treating people different on the color of their skin is clearly on the wrong side of history, but it's, all, it's also on the wrong side of theology. And then in 1920, the women's suffrage, uh, in which the 19th Amendment was added that gave women the right to vote. Why on earth we didn't think that women were able to vote before 1920 is beyond me. And so what this argument does is it links sexuality to the equivalency of your um, gender 
as well as your ethnicity. And so it tries, the argument links those three things. Dr. Preston Sprinkle in the book that we talked about, he said this, therefore the argument proceeds fully affirming and accepting LGBTQ people is a justice issue and a part of human civil rights. Here's the flaw of the argument. It's twofold. One, again, I don't believe your sexuality is anywhere close to linking to your ethnicity or your gender. I think those things are decided upon birth at the chromosome level. That answers that, by the way. You, you can't change your chromosomes. God made it impossible. And so those things are decided. And to think that your sexual preference or your sexual identity then is the equivalent to those two things is ludicrous. The second problem is this, saying that this argument's going to be on the wrong side of history implies that history is moving in the right direction. It implies that the world is moving more godly. And I think anybody with two eyes and a brain can see that is not happening. So will it be on the wrong side of history? Probably. And so will a lot of things in the Bible that you and I have to stand for. I'm even going to take it a step further. If your view of the Bible and of God line up perfectly with society and culture, you're not worshiping God. Is it going to be on the wrong side of history? Maybe. Listen to what the Bible tells us the last days are going to be like. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. This is Paul writing to young Timothy. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of truth. Sound like the right side of history? And then I could go on and on in First Thessalonians. I could talk to you about Revelation. And when we read that there's a great apostasy and people are turning from their faith and there's false prophets that tell people what their itching ears want to hear. So when people come into my office and they're like, what are we going to do, Jason? This world is getting worse and worse. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. What would you expect? It's what the Bible says. God gave us revelation not to be scared but to be prepared. And so is this world getting worse? Yeah, yeah, it is. Is standing for the things of God going to be on the wrong side of history? Maybe earthly history, but not eternal history. Ooh, shots fired. Let's move on, because some of you have not breathed in 20 minutes. And by the way, also, by the way, you're also under the idea that man is inherently good, and so whatever you desire, it must be good. You Calvinists would call this the depravity of man, that man and his nature is sinful, is broken, and that our default is not godly. And so to say, because I like this and because this is what society says, the argument doesn't work. The next one's going to be a fun one, by the way. Somebody turned this in, so thanks for that. Uh, God's judgment on Sodom isn't a judgment on same-sex relationships. <laughs> hey, let's have open night, uh, mic night. I'll let one of you come up here and answer this question for me. No takers? You're like, ah, oh, you're not serious. I kind of am, yeah. So let me tell you um, this story real quick. I'll give you a quick update and, and, and wrap it up in, of what happened here in a short amount of time. Very long story short. There's a city called Sodom. There's an area called Gomorrah, and it's kind of this plain area, um, P-L-A-I-N. And um, what happens is, is that Lot moves into this city with his family. They, rather than changing the family, they become changed. And there's all kinds of immorality going on in this city. God can't even find 10 righteous people in the whole city. He sends two angels. The angels come in. It's surround, the house that they're in is surrounded by a bunch of men who are demanding to send the angels out so that they can rape them. And that shows you just an idea of exactly how uh, sexually immoral this entire town was. And so God destroys it. Here's an artist's rendition, doom and gloom, of him destroying Sodom by just bringing, it, bringing judgment down upon it, wipes it out, not in existence today. So the argument for the affirming camp is, is that God didn't destroy this because of same-sex sex. 
He destroyed it for a litany of other reasons. So let's talk about it. In the story of Sodom and Gomorrah that we find, first of all, I don't know how you read this story and say that the Bible is boring. You ever heard somebody say the Bible is boring? I'm like, man, some of this stuff we couldn't even put on network TV. Maybe HBO, maybe, right? But, but the Bible is certainly not boring. So anyways, that's this argument by that verses itself that tell this story, you can't really figure out what exactly it was outside of an umbrella of sexual immorality of why God destroyed it. But here's the cool part about the Bible is that the Bible often translates itself. And you can find other parts of Scripture that reference each other because it's God-breathed, it's Holy Spirit-inspired. And so you can find things from the Old Testament that prophetically talk about the New Testament. You can find things in the New Testament that talk about things of the Old Testament. And so by itself, I couldn't tell you the answer to this question. It would be inconclusive. But if I show you a couple other places in Scripture, I think you and I can line up the idea of why God destroyed Sodom. This is an Old Testament prophet, Ezekiel, God speaking through him, Ezekiel 16, 49. Sodom Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, and laziness. While the poor and the needy suffered outside her door, she, the city, was proud and committed detestable sins, so I wiped her out as you have seen. So then the question is, is what are the detestable sins? Was it gang rape? Was it homosexuality? Was it sexual immorality? Was it pride? Was it perversion? Was it gluttony? And the answer is yes. Yes, it was. Jesus actually references Sodom in two different parts of Scripture. Matthew eleven twenty three. 23, these are words in red. And you, Capernaum, you, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in it had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Let's move back to Matthew 10, 14. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave the town, shake the dust off your feet. That sounds like a country song. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. What Jesus is talking about right here is that he wiped them out because of their unrepentance, because they did not repent for the sexual immorality, so he wiped it out. And he's saying if people are not willing to listen to what you say, move on somewhere else. Their unrepentant hearts, don't waste it. Move on to somewhere else, someone who will listen. And so the city is wiped out because of its unrepentance. I ask you, what did it need to repent for? Jesus' half-brother Jude addresses this. This is a damaging portion of Scripture for the affirming community. Jude, Jude 1, 7. And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality of every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. So I think that we can see that sexual immorality is sexual immorality, and because of that, God destroyed Sodom. But here's the thing that you and I need to learn from this, is that oftentimes the tendency is to create a God in which repentance is never necessary. If I can justify and manipulate Scripture for whatever I desire, then I never have to repent. This whole thing is based upon the idea that we need to repent. If we didn't need to repent, then Jesus didn't need to die on the cross. And so what I see is this creating this God in our own image that isn't God. And oftentimes if churches do affirm, they're painting the picture of a God that doesn't actually exist. It's all based upon repentance. I think it's dangerous theology. The very last one that we're going to address, and then we're going to talk about you and make you feel guilty, is uh, the, the very last question <laughs> is this. It's inconsistent to follow the Old Testament on same-sex sex, but not on shellfish. Funny thing, um, but really, honestly, it's a good point. In fact, this one right here, I think it makes the most sense of what needs to be addressed, and it's how do you pick and choose what in the Old Testament you're going to believe and what is, you're not, what are parts of the Old Testament are relevant to society today and what aren't, and you seem to be picking, picking the one on homosexuality, but you ignore that you can't eat at Red Lobster either, which is probably why it's going bankrupt. I'll tell you, Gerald is devastated about that, by the way devastated. Nobody loves Madison a Red Lobster more than Gerald McCormick. Um, anyways, uh, <laughs> here's what I want to start off by just telling you. This is an interesting argument, but the food is a cop-out. Anybody who has been to seminary or has an education whatsoever in this background knows the answer to this question. 
They're just banking on that you don't know the answer to this question, but they know the answer. This isn't a real argument of anybody who has actually studied this. Good news for you? I have. So let me just tell you just for a moment, Jesus said that I didn't come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. So there are elements of the law that are still in existence. When Jesus died on the cross, the Ten Commandments didn't go away. Right? But there are elements of the law that were necessary that are no, no longer necessary. And shellfish is one of them, but let's talk for just a moment about a few other things. So, so many of the old parts of the Old Testament law were for you to be pure, ritualistically pure and clean, so that you could enter the temple and give the sacrifice. So before you could do that, because you were not able to be in the presence of a holy God, you had to go through some rituals and some cleanliness issues so that you could be clean. You and I now no longer have to go through a high priest, go into the tabernacle clean, and have sacrifices that will, will pay the price for our sin or push it forward. We don't have to do that anymore because Jesus died on the cross the perfect spotted lamb whose sacrifice and blood was sufficient for all. Now we don't have to make sacrifices. So since we don't have to make sacrifices, we don't have to go into the temple. Because we don't have to go into the temple, we don't need priests. And because we don't have to go into the temple and we don't need priests, the ritualist, ritualistically pure is not necessary anymore. The shellfish is a little bit different. Jesus talked about this. Mark seven eighteen through 19. He says, are you so dull? <laughs> He's talking to the religious people. But I love this phrase because I just love Jesus. Like, I say a version of this to my kids nearly every day. <laughs> like, what are you thinking? Like, for real? You serious? You idiots? All of those things. I don't say that all the time. But why are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go in their heart but into their stomach and then out of their body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. See, they had dietary restrictions. Some of it was for ritualistic purposes. But often it was to create themselves, the Jews, that they would be different in a society. They would stand out as different. So people would say, who are these people and who is this God they worship? It was designed to stand out and be different. From being monotheistic in a very polytheistic culture all the way to their dietary restrictions. You and I, even now, we are called to live a life that's different. So that when people see how you live, they'll say, what's, what's up with that girl? How she have joy in the middle of all of this? Who's her God? I want to know him. We're designed to be different, and that's why the dietary restrictions were there. There's another portion in Acts. So Peter was an apostle to the Jews, Paul the Gentiles. Peter is an apostle to Jews. He had to address some things with Jews, and one of those things was their food. So you got to remember, as soon as Jesus declares this, you still got to get word out. Like, you can't just put it on Twitter and everybody knows. Like, it takes a while to get word out of the dietary restrictions, which, by the way, would have been incredibly difficult for some of these Jews because this is how they lived. And it was their whole life. And now all of a sudden they're like, wait, we're eliminating those? God gives Peter a vision. It's an ax. It's the clearest thing of all time. It's, it's not disputed. Again, I told you, people that know this, that have had education in this, they're just banking on that you don't. This is a pretty weak argument. Listen to what happens, Acts 10, 9 through 16. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. A more accurate translation would be a vision from God. He received a vision. He saw heaven opened up and something like a large sheet being let down to earth on its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Some of you hunters, that's your motto. <laughs> get up, kill and eat. And the Cro-Magdon hunters... Uh, anyways, I told my wife, my wife, this is a side note, by the way, uh, her whole family's from Montana, so they're all hunters. Uh, they think that um, something's wrong with me because if I killed something, I would probably cry. Uh, and I told them one time, I said, I don't hunt animals. I hunt for deals on clothes. I'm a hunter too. They had the same reaction you just did. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 14, surely not, Peter replied. I have not eaten anything impure that God has made 
I have not eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Here's an artist's rendition of this dream, this vision. And what this did is now it declared all foods clean. Here's why it's important. Because now the gospel is not just for the Jews. It is for the Gentiles. It is for all of mankind. So the dietary restrictions go away and all of the Jewish restrictions. So now anyone can have access to the Lord, to God, through Jesus. And that's why this is important. That's why you can eat shellfish. So you shrimp lovers, you're good. All you can eat shrimp, you're all right. That's what you clap for, Stone. I want to pivot our time, and I want to share something with you. Uh, I have a friend who um, we met in college and became friends in college um, over 20 years ago. Mm. And uh, we've been friends ever since. And after our friendship, um, he told me a few years later that he um, now was going to be following his same-sex attractions. And he is a gay married male, and we still talk. Uh, mostly go back and forth and give him a hard time because he's a Seahawks fan, which is awful. Um, But we still talk. We still have a level of friendship. There's a difference, by the way, church, between friendship and influence. There's a difference. And he knows very much how I stand, what I stand for and how I feel about things. And I know his lifestyle, but I respect him. I value him as a human being. And I sent him an email, a couple, I sent him a text a couple of weeks ago and asked him if I could email him a couple questions. I said, I'm talking on this topic. He says, I know, I follow you on social media. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> and I said, I would love to ask you a couple questions. You answer them to the level of how comfortable you are. And I would like to share your answers with the church I go to. And I asked him some questions. And he shared his answers. Right or wrong, whether I agree with it or not, this is what his feelings are. And I want us to hear it. So I think it's important. So a couple questions I asked him. Um, I said, um, what, are some, what were some of your biggest fears when you told your family about your same-sex attraction? How did they handle it? What are some ways that Christians have handled this topic with you poorly? What are some ways they've handled it well? Um, I said, what advice would you give to a Christian that does not support same-sex marriage but still desires to show you compassion and, have, and value you as a person? And what would you want a non-affirming church to hear? And he gave me some answers and... Um, some were tough. Some were tough to hear. So I'm just going to share little bits and pieces of what he said. Um, he said, one of my biggest fears when telling my family that I was gay was I knew that they wouldn't accept it. Uh, individual family members may be okay with it, but I know that every single one of them wishes I was straight. My parents were disappointed that they would never have grandchildren. Uh, my family did not handle me coming out well. Uh, my dad was a minister at the time at the Baptist church. And he outed me to the entire church from stage. I have a problem with that. He says, my uncle was murdered for being gay in San Francisco in 1986. My parents always told me that their biggest fear was that one of their kids would be gay. I said, "Um, what are some ways that Christians have handled this topic with you poorly? He said, there's been a myriad of ways, but mostly I've been ignored, told I'm going to hell, and someone told the people in my neighborhood, don't be surprised if they try to molest your children. I said, what are some ways that Christians have handled this well? And he said, I don't have any. What advice would you give to people who don't affirm your your lifestyle, your sexuality, but want to still love you and value as a person. And he said, listen more than you talk. He said, don't throw scripture at me. Just embrace me as a human being. Uh, He said that if you tell me that my sexuality isn't my identity, then ask me questions about my identity, about my hopes, my dreams, my past, my hobbies. He says, "Um, you don't have to accept the way that I live but just know that every single human desires to be loved. I read a book called Us Versus Us, and they did this huge study of people who claim to be Christians but have same-sex attraction. I say claim because it's just what they said on the survey. And this gentleman has a big survey. He said that um, 
that over that 96% of the people surveyed at one point in time had prayed that God would take away their same-sex attraction. Um, so now what? What do we do? And this last part's going to be quick. I've put together three different things that I think that we can do now with this knowledge and how we go out and win a world and a whole area of a group of people that the church has done a very poor job of ministering to. And I've put together th a threefold strategy. The first one is don't be afraid to call sin, sin. We don't want to call sin, sin. So we're afraid we're going to hurt people. In fact, really in the Western church, we really minimize the effect of sin that even has in our own lives. We really minimize it. In some way, the, the sacrificial system with the animals would probably be good for us to see for a minute or two because I think that we would really be aware of the cost of sin. I have a quote from Jackie Hill Perry's book about sin and her experience. She says this, sin, when in the body, cannot stay put. It is not a guest that stays in one room making sure not to disturb others. It is a tenant that lives in everything and goes everywhere. It can bleed into every part, choking out anything holy. Being born human meant that I had the capacity for affection and logic. Being born sinful meant that both were inherently broken. The unnamed attraction I felt at an elemental level only highlighted how greedy sin can be. Desires exist because God gave them to us, but homosexual desires exist because sin does. Loving him as we were created to do involves both will and the affections, but sin steals the love God placed in us for himself and tells it to go elsewhere. Same-sex desires are actual. Though born of sin, they aren't an imaginary feeling one conjures up for the sake of being different. But the actuality of the affection doesn't make it morally justifiable. And it is the mind, when conformed to the image of sin, that moves us to call evil good simply because it feels good to us. Jesus argued with people all the time. He talked to people very different. He talked to, to James different than he talked to Peter. He talked to Peter different than he talked to John. He talked to the woman at the well different than he talked to Peter. He talked to the woman that was caught in adultery that was about to be stoned very different. What did he do? He met her where she was. He said, where are your accusers? Neither am I here to condemn you. And he said, but go and sin no more. Compassion, but don't be afraid to call sin, sin. The second one is establish your primary identity. Establish your primary identity. I have up on the screen what I've put together of the layers of Jason's identity. The first thing that I am is a Christian, a follower of Jesus. The second thing is a man, then a husband, then a father. There's a fifth one, a 49ers fan. Uh, but, but all of those things. This is the order that it has to be because whatever is above trumps what is below. Here's what I mean. If I am going to call myself a follower of God, then the second thing is Jason is a man, and anything that Jason as a man desires, if it is against what the, th the identity above me is as a follower of God, I have to yield my desires to the authority of God. If not, then I'll put God under me, and now Jason is God. And so your identity as a man or as a woe man has to line up with submitting to what God says or you're not a follower of God. And it's okay if you're not, but don't be so audacious to think you can call yourself a follower of God, but then create him in your own image. And so then even more, if you look, my identity as a husband and then my identity as a father, those are the orders. So you have to establish what you think the order of your identity is. And if the very first thing is that you're a Christian, then you have to do what the Bible says or that isn't part of your identity. It's the level of authority. The very last one, and arguably the most important, is to understand that it is the Holy Spirit that transforms lives. So we're going to end it with this. I'm going to skip that last quote. We're going to end it with this. Our job is to get people to have the Holy Spirit grow in their lives. Jesus said when he was leaving, he talked to the disciples. He said, when I leave, the Father will send the advocate, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will remind you of the things that I've taught you. So when you're like, how does the world not know they're sinning? How do they keep living this way and they just have no ideas? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit. 
So there's nothing there to remind them. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin. I don't know if any of you have a background like I do, but for years I battled with lust addiction, and I wanted to overcome it, but I was solely based upon my own willpower. And my willpower could get me maybe a couple of weeks of the purity of my eyes, if I'm lucky a month or two, but inevitably the willpower wasn't enough. And I wanted to be better. Do you know what changed my life? was when I started focusing less on the sin and more on the sanctification. I decided to tell my wife I was going to jump two feet in the deep end of following God. And I was going to pray. I read the Bible when I was 33 years old for the very first time in a whole year. I committed to it and I did it. It's amazing to me how many believers you're basing your eternity on a book that you've never actually read cover to cover. How stupid is that? <laughs> Not calling you stupid, but in the words of Jesus, are you so dull? <laughs> just think about that for just a second. And through this process, the Holy Spirit grew the fruits of the Spirit in me, and these things that for years I could never get freedom from, they kind of lost their authority in my life and their power in my life. And so you and I as believers, we have to live a life that is going to be something that will attract people to want to be like us and follow what we believe. We have to live a life that way, something that's attractive. And then what we have to do is get them to fall in love with the Lord and let the Holy Spirit do the work. You're not going to convict somebody through a passive-aggressive Facebook post, especially during the month of June. You're not going to convict somebody. This knowledge isn't, isn't for them. It's for you so that you know what you believe. Now we have to love people, show them the love of God, and allow the Holy Spirit to convict them. But don't you be afraid to call sin sin. Sin is sin. But I think we have a world to win, and I think we have a group of people that the church has discarded and attacked and done a terrible job, and I think we can do better. And I think God can use us. Thank you so much for watching this video. It truly is an honor to be able to spend a little bit of time with you. I wanna encourage you, if you wanna keep up with all of the latest things going on at Centerpoint Church, you can subscribe to this channel. You can hit that bell for alerts so that you won't miss anything. And most importantly, if this impacted you in any way, like, I wanna hear about it. We wanna celebrate with you, we wanna serve you. So if you go to centerpointtn.com, click on contact us, and we can't wait to get connected with you.